So welcome to the Business of Health. I'm Giselle wertheim Ames, and we are hosted on the Nielsen Network. Today, I'm going to be speaking to Peter Fedichev. He's a PhD and founder and CEO of a company called Jira. And today, we are going to be speaking about the world of artificial intelligence. Jira is a company that develops new drugs for aging and other complex disorders using very proprietary developed artificial intelligence platform. Last week, they announced um, that they had received a whole lot of funding, $2.2 million to be exact, and a Series A funding. It's a company based out of Singapore, and they are pitching close to $8 million now in funding to really develop this concept of artificial intelligence, and specifically, as we said, around complex disorders. So today, we're really going to be talking to Peter in the context, first of all, of artificial intelligence, the future, how it impacts business, and obviously, this is within the context of the world of health. And also, we're living in the middle of a, a COVID uh, pandemic. But before, let me explain Peter to you. He's a passionate scientist. He has a background in biophysics and bioformatics um, and content, condensed matter physics, which, Peter, you'll have to explain to me. And he really is the driving force behind this team. He earned his PhD at the University of Amsterdam and conducted research um, at the FAM Institute and I'm off in Netherlands and the University of Innsbruck. He's published over 70 papers covering his research in physics, biophysics, and aging biology. So you are absolutely uh, qualified on the aging perspective, and you're going to demystify for us, Peter, the concept of artificial intelligence, which we all hear about, but I guess it's really understanding its potential in solving aging and health and complex disorders in health. Could you elaborate for us, please? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, for the explanation. Um, we are talking about uh, complex living systems. So I think everyone would agree that we are complex machines. And uh, of course, it's very difficult to reconstruct uh, how complex machine, uh, machines work. So um, most of us uh, will, unfortunately, or already have uh, succumbed to chronic diseases. And you may mention that uh, humanity as a whole is extremely successful in, uh, in uh, defending against, for example, infectious diseases. I mean, most of them have been eradicated as soon as we get a new disease, just within a few years we, get, we have a solution. Think, for example, about AIDS. It was discovered, it was recognized as a problem, then in less than five years there was first drugs. Now there are multiple drugs and people with AIDS are now living more or less normal life. Uh, as soon as it comes to an infectious disease, we are very successful. But if you look at, for example, chronic diseases like diabetes, it appears that we are in a more or less miserable situation. We are still curing uh, diabetes with metformin, with a drug which was uh, originally used in folks' uh, medicine in Europe, and since then was uh, recognized as a drug uh, in Europe 50 years ago. So something, so something strange is going on. As soon as we have a very specific pathogen related to an infectious disease, we kill it with modern technology. But we cannot find out how diabetes or cancer tick. So we are dealing with what I would call complex or intractable diseases, the diseases that take ages to develop, which, has no speci which have no specific gene responsible for that disease. And that's why you cannot study them in the lab. So for example, uh, we can cure mice from any form, form of Alzheimer's disease in mice, but none of those drugs work in humans, right? So the situation always repeats. We cannot learn how to fight diseases from mice and translate that in humans, because mice live just for two years and humans live 50, 60, and nowadays almost 70 years without serious problems. So what can you learn by doing experiments in mice? And unfortunately, this is a standard paradigm in biology so far. First you heal the mice, then you go to the humans, and then you find that your drug doesn't work in phase two or phase three clinical trials. The lack of efficacy is now the major problem. So we believe that instead, instead of trying to cure a mouse from any other disease, we should go and look how actually humans get disease and how diseases progress in humans. And for that, we need to go and actually look at large scale medical data, like medical records, to look at that huge amount of data to actually understand how young people become old, how old people become sick, how sick people become uh, dead, essentially. 
And that's something which requires so much data to analyze that you need just another technology uh, to, to, to be used. And this technology is obviously artificial intelligence. So, so that really is what you refer to as that biomedical data, that, that thousands and thousands, I guess, of files that you are going to use artificial intelligence to trawl along and to yeah, try okay. and make sense of. Yeah, look, we are, we are uh, almost 10 billion uh, people on this planet. So um, since recently, uh, it's, it's became possible to actually collect uh, medical information on those people in electronic form. There are now countries which have uh, medical uh, records uh, digitized. So we have now tens of millions of people with all their medical life actually stored in electronic form, in a, in a, in a form which is uh, useful uh, to be investigated uh, with computers. And that's so much information that no human being or even maybe all human beings together uh, would have any chance uh, to actually analyze and to understand what's going on. It's almost like weather prediction. So if you have just a human being to predict the weather, you have certain, you know, fault traditions uh, and explanations what kind of weather to expect next year, depending on the weather at a certain date. Just want to ask you on that, um, you say you have access to it. How, how is that access given? Yeah, the, the, uh, the access is given on several levels. So first, uh, first we have access to biobanks. This is the, the, the top quality of data. So for example, UK Biobank, this is a government initiative, which I think is uh, no least expensive than the most expensive weapon programs in decent countries. This is a very respectable uh, thing to do because what uh, British are doing, they're collecting uh, genetics, uh, molecular and physiological markers, and clinical histories of half a million of Britons. So uh, the project is already more than 10 years old, which means that uh, you actually know what happens to these people once uh, they are analyzed and digitized. This allows you in principle to do predictive models. You can measure a human being right now and you can predict what's going to happen in 10 years, which is already a long time. So I think in 10 years, Britons will know almost everything in terms of what can happen to a Briton on the British soil in terms of uh, medical information. This is not all because uh, the key in our understanding is to actually observe the human being multiple times during the lifetime. Because if you have only one measurement of any human being once in a lifetime, and you have maybe even billions of people like that, you will still end up with wrong conclusions. The bad joke would be that, for example, in New York, you are born poor and most probably a person of a color. But uh, at the age of 80 years old, uh, you are dying white and possibly rich. So if you do not, if you do not observe the same human being uh, for, the, for, for the substantial duration of lifetime, you start picking uh, wrong correlation, which have nothing to do with uh, personal medical histories. So that's why we are looking for what is called longitudinal data, the data connecting many dots along the lifeline of the same individual. And we're actually acquiring data from medical diagnostic companies. These are exactly the people who are measuring, for example, doing blood work uh, for us all our, all our life. And these people have stored millions of points. So essentially they know life histories of individual human beings. And that's the data which, uh, will be, with which we are working. Uh, with. And Peter, does it cross over region or is it very specifically focused on, on certain regions in the world? Well, that's uh, from, the, from our Department of Politically Incorrect uh, Studies. <laughs> of course, uh, we all know that uh, ethnical difficulties also, the, uh, sorry, the ethnical di differences and also the differences in lifestyle, weather, climate, uh, maybe some cultural traditions all of them uh, have influence on diseases. So we know that people in different regions uh, suffer predominantly from, uh, for example, even different forms of oncology. And that, would, that could be partially in our genes, but it could be also to a large extent in our lifestyle. So that's why, uh, well, of course, we are looking at the, we are carefully investigating ethnic composition in UK Biobank, which is our reference source. But also, since we are now in Singapore, we're also working with uh, Singaporean scientists that have access to Singaporean data banks. And Singapore is an extremely advanced country in this as aspect. Uh, they have almost all of their, uh, more than half of their medical records digitalized at this point. And yes, we're, spe we're looking specifically 
at uh, medical histories of people of uh, similar ethnic uh, background, for example, living in two different countries, and that's how we're trying to control for that. Because that obviously, as, you, as we know, will, there will be differences across regions, and it is, I assume your data does then rely on countries having these data banks available. So countries that perhaps don't have them available, we're not going to get consistent or robust data, enough data um, over, over the time required. So that tells me that probably in certain parts of the world, you're going to get results and be able to get clearer pictures. Maybe you, you can explain to us what you're seeing already, if that's at all possible, um, around some of the data that you are collecting. Well, uh, first of all, we see, I think, uh, obvious things. Uh, of course, we understand that uh, our health and our longevity is only partially in our genes. So the, the lifestyle choices make enormous effect. Uh, on our health. We can see, for example, well, there are, there are trivial things. We know that money can buy your health. So, for example, social status uh, contributes, well, surprisingly important uh, for the long-term uh, health or for the fragility, in a way, of our organism. Uh, there are interesting studies in animals uh, suggesting that uh, some of the hormonal systems which uh, respond to social status signals are actually involved in longevity, and that's what uh, the data apparently shows. It appears that uh, it does not depend so much as people think on uh, access to medical, uh, uh, to, to medical facilities, for example. It's really in the, in the, uh, in the situation of the people. But other than uh, that, uh, we all know that we live in a very toxic environment for two reasons, and people also underestimate this. Uh, one, uh, one, I think one of the most underestimated things is the, uh, is the quality of sleep. People may be surprised uh, how much sleep quality changes the state of your immune system and uh, the cognitive skills and so on and so on. So people who do not sleep well, uh, they are at risk of diseases, even those people who are not going to the gym and do not smoke. The quality of sleep is, uh, is, is very important. And, uh, well, the, the other thing I would tell is that we are living in the world which is abundant with food. Uh, no human being had ever access to such an, uh, such an amount of food as we have right now. Uh, we, we are not evolutionarily tuned to restrict ourselves in food because I think for the last uh, billion of years, uh, the, uh, the approach was that if there is a lot of food, it means that it's autumn and there will be winter. So you should eat as much as you can. So there are, there are no mechanisms whatsoever to actually uh, stop you from overfeeding. That uh, kills us. Uh, in, in the advanced countries, the, the quality of food, the amount of food, the food-related disorders, they are major contributors uh, to overall health. So we see people that uh, take efforts uh, to control uh, feeding and sleep can have quite dramatic results in terms of the, uh, I mean, I'm not talking about the expected lifetime. That's never known, right? But what I'm talking about here is that even if you ask people, if you do self-reports like questionnaires, how the quality of life questionnaires, you will see that uh, control over food and the control over sleep produces almost immediate uh, changes in self-reported health. I think you, 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 you again confirm what a lot of scientists speak about this issue that you, you can influence your health by your lifestyle habits. And it's very interesting that you raise the sleep issue and the, the food issue because they also totally, the two are related, how you regulate what you eat affects your sleep and vice versa, how your energy is used during the day. Um, so I think that that's, that that's really, when you look at, at AI, obviously you, you, that, that kind of information is going to become apparent. So if you took that down to an individualized level of using AI, would it be possible one day to see what my, almost what my blueprint is? I mean, we know we can do it from genetic tests. I can have a genetic test and there's some extrapolation that can show me what I'm going to be susceptible to. But could AI help with that too, Peter? Yeah, I think it, uh, it, it will, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, we, we know already that uh, there are certain gene variants which make you predisposed uh, to certain diseases. Some of them are so dangerous, for example, like breast cancers. We all know this Angelina Jolie story. So there are at least some uh, gene variants which are so certainly uh, related uh, to certain uh, negative outcomes that people should uh, really be concerned about that. 
Unfortunately, I think uh, overall the, the result was a bit uh, disappointing because if you look at your 23andMe uh, genetic report right now, you would find that you have uh, such and such uh, vulnerabilities, but most of the time it would be you have 6% risk uh, on top of the medium 3% risk, which is, uh, which is not a lot. I mean, it looks like a double risk, but still we're talking about very, uh, very minor things. That's exactly where actually AI can be used in order to improve the quality of uh, predictions. We have just recently put a paper uh, with Harvard Medical School professor Vadim Gladyshev, where we looked specifically at very rare mutations. And the rare mutations are interesting because each of us has about 60 mutations, which totally knock out uh, one gene each. So that's not so scary because we have 20,000 genes. So 60 of them doesn't look you know, too dangerous. And also for most of the genes, we have two copies uh, from Papa and from Mama, which means that if, um, even if one of them is knocked out, most probably we have the other one working. working. The interesting part here is that we are working mutants. I mean, we are, we are alive. We have uh, up to 60, about 60 genes uh, knocked out. And when, then when we start suffering a disease, for example, or if we measure aging, some people, who are lucky enough to, to have the right genes uh, knocked out by chance, these people may live longer or they may survive under certain diseases better. And that's exactly what our AI system is looking at. We, we, we are trying, as I told you at the beginning, we do not want to, to learn about aging and diseases in mice. We want to look in large human populations and see for those lucky one people who have the right mutations by chance we want to learn with the help of AI to identify those lucky individuals, to study them as groups, to make sure that we do not have uh, statistical artifacts. And once we get them, we can, have, we can see that in, uh, in real nature, in, in real world, these people are protected from certain diseases. And then, of course, we want to make a drug which would make the same effect for the rest of us. And this is really a very simple concept which is uh, behind our company. And that always seems to me almost like, you know, science fiction um, when you think about that. But we know that there have been advances in this concept of personalized medicine, where, again, some people will react to certain medication in one way and other people don't the other. So there is often there's no, you know, this idea that everyone will react the same is, is, is now accepted, that that is no longer possible, correct? So that's a very interesting um, concept that when we look at use AI to look at people's genealogy and the ones who are winning and who are strong, what makes them strong to be able to use some of that to help others um, is, is something new. Are there, what are the ethical, I mean, from, a, from a, a global perspective, there are obviously some countries that are more forward thinking around these kind of concepts than others. Is that, is it getting easier over time, Peter? Because you've obviously been doing this a fair amount of time. Are we seeing more and more an acceptance that, we're going to move forward in and break down these boundaries using technology? Well, I think there are still a uh, lot, lot, lot of uh, steps uh, to be, uh, there are a lot of obstacles uh, to be overcome in the real world because uh, well, the, well, most, well, the, the biggest well, issue, problem, challenge is that we're talking about personal uh, data of living people. It's of course nice to think that uh, by this kind of research we're producing new, new drugs and help cure diseases and that's all very nice. The nastier part of this thing is that uh, imagine that your insurance company knows about your genetic makeup or maybe about your current uh, health state. Maybe your employer uh, would know something you would rather uh, not wish him uh, to know. And the technology becomes very invasive because uh, just think for a moment uh, what kind of information your Google search history can actually uh, reveal uh, to, to anyone. So it contains all, all kinds of also, uh, well, information about your psychology, health, everything. And all of that is connected and can be used in principle in order to introduce maybe some uh, super nasty things like social scoring on steroids. So we, we do not know at this time, I mean, the, the, the technological possibilities are infinite here. But uh, depending on the social structure, on the, uh, rule, o, o, on the law system in every country, you can either build a concentration help camp with improved health uh, of in, inmates, or you can uh, make up a more productive society. So uh, the ethical problems are immense. Uh, so that's why I think people should move uh, carefully 
So that's why I like, for example, this British idea that uh, the data is shared for the researchers. The personal data is not available, so you cannot depersonalize these people. So this is very heavily protected. There are very strict rules on how you use this information. You can translate this into medical technologies right away, but if you start thinking about uh, disrupting insurance industry, you may think twice uh, before you start counting money because I think uh, you can easily go in the wrong way. And, and Peter, these are absolutely valid concerns because if I, you know, as a, on a human, on an individual level, just being a normal person in the street, I am, I would be very nervous about having my data in a, in a way that could be used in any way against me. So that, that point is taken. But how does one get sort of a global buy-in? Because AI has the potential, has immense, amazing potential to do so good. But as we know, it could also be misused or abused. So are there any structures that are set up globally through any of the, you know, the, 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 the more, I don't want to call it the more established health structures, but, um, but there are, you know, these, these global regulatory bodies, or are we going to find that it's just going to be by country, um, where different countries have their own rules that define then how AI plays out in, in the environments, except how do you control that across digital platforms that have open access and where there's open discussion and open sharing and all of this? Well, well first of all, I think that uh, if we're talking about AI in medical sciences, uh, I think we have uh, very good guidelines. I know that pe some people uh, complain about regulators. Uh, I would rather tell something in uh, protection of them and to show them some respect because for me, AI is, is just yet another technology. I mean, this is a disruptive technology with potential uh, good and uh, evil applications, but uh, for the regulators, this is just yet another technology and you know, how many more of them are going to happen uh, next year. So what these people are doing very well is that they are working to protect uh, all uh, participants in the market. I mean, in investors, uh, patients, uh, pharma companies, everyone. So they enforce uh, strict ethical rules. They may be annoying for would-be disruptive innovators, but uh, I think they're doing a great job in protecting everybody's interest. Yeah, so if I look at the regulators in the, in the top countries, uh, even though we are hearing complaints, I think that they are, they are very cool. They are, they are letting people uh, use AI in diagnostic. Uh, you, of course, they are letting people to share medical information. You can train your AI, you can work with medical data under lots of regulation, but you can do that. Of course, if you end up with a drug, nobody cares anymore if this drug is developed with AI or not, it just should work. And uh, that's what all these regulators are doing for you. That's of course costs money, but at the end of the day, we have patients uh, who may have hopes and they don't want uh, to be disappointed. I mean, the drug has to work uh, for them. So I would, I would try to use the, the, the regulations, which are already there, and uh, my uh, uh, my, my view at that is that uh, we survived uh, nuclear uh, technology, which wasn't, yeah. you know, uh, too safe. And I think we will survive uh, any other one. It's a very good analogy. We survived nuclear technology. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, so, we were on the brink at a few times. So yeah. I think people yeah. are learning from that. So mo moving on to the next point, we are living in this incredible time where this global pandemic has broken out and different countries have reacted differently. And I saw that you, you, you have um, noted even on your own website and you've been um, commenting on how AI could be used right now to um, start helping uh, health authorities manage this, this pandemic and, the, and looking at the medical research that is being done. Can you, uh, again, can you perhaps elaborate more on this? Yeah, first of all, let me explain why uh, I'm so interested uh, with COVID because uh, obviously viral infectious diseases are not uh, our focus. Uh, the most interesting and once again troubling uh, thing with uh, COVID is that uh, if you look at chances to die from COVID, uh, these uh, chances unfortunately grow exponentially with age. So uh, the, uh, your ch somebody's uh, chances to die once infected actually double every year. And this doubling time is surprisingly close to doubling of all cause mortality uh, rate associated with aging. So it appears that uh, the extreme, uh, the dangerous forms of COVID disease, and disease are obviously associated with aging. 
So that, that was the reason why we jumped into this situation, mostly with the idea to understand would, uh, would uh, any drugs which we are doing against aging be helpful uh, to patients uh, which are suffering from COVID. So it's not yet, of course, known. I mean, people uh, have started uh, drugs with potential anti-aging effects. Uh, they are now being tried in clinical trials against uh, the virus. Uh, some of them, uh, some of them, I have to say, with some disappointing results already. But what we can see that, uh, and I think there will be results uh, published soon. It appears that if you pre-treat uh, vulnerable individuals with anti-aging drugs uh, before before the infectious disease season, you will have less cases of a disease, and obviously you will save lives. So I think the whole industry is now moving to the situation is that we have people who are older than they are at any chronological age. I mean, your passport age is not something which is you know, relevant in a hospital. So uh, I think that the idea of this biological age as a universal measure of aging uh, is uh, now getting acceptance. I think that maybe in 10 years from now, we will have a situation where every year before the season of infectious, before in, in autumn, before the flu season, uh, people who are vulnerable, who have biologic, biological aging indicators very high up, maybe after chemotherapy or maybe because of the advanced stage, these people will uh, be preferably vaccinated, maybe, maybe with higher dose of the vaccine because it doesn't work for them, or maybe they would be even pre-treated with uh, experimental anti-aging drugs just to make sure that these people are extra protected uh, for the dangerous season. So I think what this COVID uh, epidemic pandemics uh, can bring uh, upon us is a better understanding that we have, as you told at the very beginning, we have an increasing population of, uh, elder, of elders. We have more people over, I think, 65 than before, below 15 in Canada or something like that, where this is this demographic transition, which makes an increasing uh, number of people uh, into this super vulnerable state. And I think as uh, as uh, the humanity must find ways to protect no, them, not against a specific disease, because every year, every 10 years, we'll get another, another new thing. We'll, we'll need uh, to find ways effectively to rejuvenate them, to make sure that whatever comes, these people are less susceptible. And I think that would be a, a crucial step to, to get, uh, to, to recognize anti-aging medicine as an actual medical option. I know that a lot of scientists also talk about aging should be seen as a disease, which it isn't recognized as a disease. And, and if it were, then perhaps there would be a different approach taken to how we, we deal with it. Which I think, again, when we see what's happening now with COVID and as we see technologies like AI and many others come to the fore, that there, we're seeing more and more discussion around that and particularly around the issue of health span versus lifespan. So biological age. Um, on that issue, where, where is this all going to, where do you see the next decade going? Because things seem to be accelerating quite rapidly now. Yes, and uh, by the way, that's exactly the place where AI helps a lot because when you have uh, that amount of medical data in order to, 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 to grasp it and actually condense it to a single number like biological age, which is kind of composite score, which tells you how old you are, that's exactly the thing where these uh, modern machine learning technologies were of uh, particular help. Uh, where it goes, I think that uh, we have seen already uh, a few times the situation like this. We have had uh, a high cholesterol level, which was not a disease because people were actually dying from heart disease. But uh, when you get a heart attack, it's a bit too late uh, to start uh, treating you with statins. So instead, people uh, produced a biomarker, a prognostic biomarker, which was the level of the cholesterol. When it was high, well, long before the actual disease strikes, uh, medic uh, doctors agreed that we should start treating these people with uh, cholesterol-lowering drugs. And that's how the whole new disease was uh, invented and established and recognized by medical profession. So it took years, actually. The first biobank was created after President Roosevelt died in order to produce these prognostic markers and so on and so on. So now things accelerate. I think that, let's say, plus five years from now, uh, with the help of AI, we will have uh, efficient measures of our biological aging. And as you know, in science, if you can measure something, you can counter it. So once there is a biomarker of aging which is recognized, 
then I see no reasons why that thing, which is associated with this biomarker like hypercholesterolemia, was recognized as a disease before it wasn't a disease before. So I think we will have accelerated aging as a disease. And that, of course, will be first recognized in situations like cancer survivors of, uh, to that matter, people who are suffering from HIV, they are living 10 years shorter still, so they have accelerated aging. Uh, kids who are surviving uh, cancer, more and more kids are now surviving cancer. They live shorter than their peers, but that's not the, the biggest problem. You know that uh, we stop learning at a certain uh, age, at about 25 years old. And that happens according to your biological age, which means that a ki if, a chill, if a kid suffers cancer and get accelerated aging due to drugs, the same person is going to stop learning earlier. So these people have less class of schooling, less income, social issues, problems, and so on. So probably, and that's what I really believe in terms of technology, we will get these measures of aging established. These kids, these, uh, their uh, cancer surviving parents will eventually get anti-aging drugs first based not on their uh, chances to die or something like that, but based on the biomarker like the new disease will be established and that disease, I don't know how it's going to be called, but in effect, that will be aging as a disease. So it really is a world where, where individuals, governments, I suppose the medical community can, can, can intervene or, or perhaps estimate and then intervene proactively to avoid a social economic impact, a negative social economic impact. That's, that's the upside of it. Yeah, that's the um, of, of artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence to guide, um, to guide health. Yeah, the, the, the punch here is that with the, with the artificial intelligence technologies, so we have a chance to do it fast. I mean, it's not, un, it's, it's, not, it, it's not like it's impossible to do it without AI. The problem is that we are living right in the middle of the demographic transition. We, have, we are having now lots of people in uh, reaching advanced age. This is the richest uh, generation ever. I mean, these people have accumulated the, 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 uh, the largest amount of money uh, in the history of, of humankind. These people may be willing to spend money for their health, obviously. Uh, they don't want to be sick. And we can uh, be in time to serve that community if we have any way of technological acceleration possible and artificial intelligence is one of them to measure aging, to produce new interventions, to test those new, interven new interventions as quickly as possible and to personalize those interventions as, as soon as they uh, show up. Thank you, Peter. I mean, that's, it's, as I said, sometimes one feels like we're living in a, in a science movie, but it's here and it's now and it's incredibly fascinating. So thank you so much for just giving us a, a little bit of a insight into what is happening in your field and for joining us here on Business of Health.